Welcome to the online worship service of Briarwood Presbyterian Church for June the 6th, 2021. My name's Judy Pemberton, and I am sitting in for the Reverend Serena Meyer, who is at General Assembly this week. Uh, I'd like to thank some people who've helped make this uh, service possible. Raphael, Judy the photographer, Stevie, Joe, and Nancy. Uh, we've been doing these services online now for 15 months, and we are tremendously appreciative of everybody who has participated, all of the singers and the readers and the speakers, and especially Nancy, uh, who has been our editing wizard and who has put all of these services together right from the very beginning. And it's a tremendous amount of work, and we certainly appreciate all that she does. So thank you, Nancy. I have three announcements for you this morning. Uh, the first is that Vacation Bible Camp is back for this year. It will run August 16th to 20th, the Rocky Railway, and registration has already begun. So if you have children who you think would have benefit from that week and you'd like to register them, please do so by calling the office or contacting Stevie. Uh, if you have youth who'd like to volunteer, or if you as an adult would like to volunteer, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, we can take limited numbers this year, so we encourage you to uh, call the office, as they say, or speak to Stevie if you're interested in that week, August 20, 16th to 20th. Secondly, next week, June 13th, is communion at both the online worship service and the in-person spoken word service. So we'd invite you to prepare for that ahead of time. And then June 20th is our ordination of elders at the in-person spoken word service. And so we just invite you to keep both of those things in your prayers and add them to your calendar. I believe that's the announcements for this morning. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. We give you thanks, O Lord, with our whole hearts. We give thanks for your steadfast love and faithfulness. O oh God, we call on you, for you will increase our strength of soul. Though we walk in the midst of troubling times, you will stretch out your hand to us. So we gather to worship God, trusting in God's goodness and guidance. We come to offer our prayers and praise, seeking God's renewing love day by day.
we turn to God with our prayers of adoration and confession. God of creation and compassion, we praise you for your attention to each and every blessed creature, marveling at the detail and the grandeur you call into being. You tend the fragile beauty and balance in the world, receiving praise from the depths of the sea to the tops of the mountains. You have seen your church grow from tiny beginnings to a worldwide community of those who follow Jesus, full of diversity in voice and vocation. Receive our praise as we witness your patience and perseverance with all you've made. Open our eyes to the purposes you have for us, for our congregation, and for our denomination. Awaken us with the insight of your spirit and reveal to us how best to serve you in the world you love. For we offer ourselves to you in the name of Christ our Lord. God of purpose and possibility, you give us work to do and the skills we need to accomplish your calling. Yet we prefer to follow our own ways. We resist your wisdom and fail to consider the suggestions of others. We think we know better. Forgive our stubborn nature and our unwillingness to reconsider our own views. By the power of your Holy Spirit and the grace of Christ our Lord, give us a teachable spirit to learn new ways to serve you and live as good neighbors in church and community. These things we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. The prophet Micah reminds us that God requires three things of us, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. To all who turn away from self-interest and seek reconciliation with God and neighbor in kindness and humility, God offers forgiveness and peace. Today I extend to all of you the peace of Christ and I invite you to do the same in your prayers for each other.
Hello! Today we are going on a detective mission with the Apostle Paul. When Paul was in Athens, he found a place of communal worship where lots of people got together to worship different gods. And in that place, he found an altar, which said, to an unknown god. Detective Paul said he could show people how to get to know that unknown god. Sometimes it can seem hard to get to know God when we can't see God or touch God. But Paul had an idea, a way to trace the clues so that we could see God, so we could get to know God. Paul said we should look at what God has made and what God has done in the world around us. Paul says, look at the world and everything in it. Look at life and all the things that have breath. Look at all of the people in all of the places all around the world. These were clues that Paul said we could follow to find God and know God, even a God we can't see and a God we can't touch. So today, I would like you to put on your detective hat and get out your magnifying glass and think to yourself, what is one way that you can see and feel God? What is one thing that makes God seem closer to you and a little less unknown? Blessings to all on this Sunday. Let us pray. Lord God, loving God, our souls wait for you more than those who watch for the morning. Send your spirit upon us as your word is read and interpreted so that we will hear your voice and know the way of the truth and love through Christ, the living word. Amen. Our first reading today is Genesis 3, verses 8 to 13 and 21 to 24. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you, you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. And the Lord God made garments for, of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he has taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden he placed a cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. Our final reading today is from Acts 17, verses 22 to 28. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through your city, I looked carefully at the objects of your worship, and I found among them an altar which, with the inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown? This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world is everything in it. He who is Lord of the heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by humans, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortal life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and their boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he was not far 
from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offsprings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we begin this morning way back in Genesis chapter 3. And every time I read these passages, and I know most people have read these passages over and over again, uh, every time I read them, I'm reminded of that old hymn by Austin. Uh, it's called In the Garden. I come to the garden alone. And of course the chorus is, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And that's what comes to mind when I read this passage about how God and Adam walked together, talked together. It also brings to mind that old joke, what is God's first name? Andy. Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. Anyway, I digress. Uh, but these passages remind us that right at the very beginning, it was God's delight. And actually, Eden in Hebrew means delight. It was God's delight to have the kind of relationship with his creation where they would walk and talk together every day and live side by side every day. And this was the kind of relationship God wanted with his creation. Of course, we know that it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. And that men decided, man decided we could do this on their own. And maybe they knew better and they made a choice to eat from the tree of good and evil. Uh, and we learned that lesson very well. And we have a knowledge of good and evil and even today, we find that we use that knowledge far too often in the wrong direction. So Adam and Eve are banned from the garden. And this was the first time I sort of read those scriptures and I had a real spatial awareness of what they were talking about, that Adam and Eve had been banned to the east and that to the west then were these cherubim set up to guard, not just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but more importantly, the tree of eternal life. And God refers to us in those verses, doesn't he? Which is just a call back to God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That we together must protect this so that man does not have the gift of eternal life. And so this pattern, this spatial awareness, was carried on through the Israelites' um, history. And we know that when God gave the word to Moses, and Moses came down with the word, they put it in an Ark of the Covenant, and they guarded it with cherubim. And God says in Exodus 25, then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. And so this tabernacle became a portable tabernacle, cornwall temple that they carried with them all the time. And it contained on the Western end, the Ark of the Covenant guarded by the cherubim. And that's where the presence of God was. And of course, we know later in the kingdom of Solomon, they actually built a temple and that temple had the same setup. You entered from the east to the outer court and there was also an inner court and then there was the Holy of Holies on the farther western end. And the Holy of Holies was protected by cherubim on the curtains. There were cherubim, symbols of cherubim, and the Ark of the Covenant was placed in there and of course carried the cherubim on either side. And so that's the holiest of holies. And that place was a place where only one of the Israelite families, and it's the families of the Aaron, of Aaron's family, uh, became the priests. And only the priest could enter the Holy of Holies and only once a year. The outer court had these basins of water for, for cleaning, for cleansing purposes. And they rested on these oxen, 12 oxen representing the, the tribes of Israel. And it also, of course, had the, the areas where they would sacrifice their animals. And the Israelites would come to the outer circle and they would make their prayers for atonement and forgiveness of sins and offer a, a sacrifice. But we know that, once again, man chose to go on in their own way and, and make their own decisions and decide they could rule under their own conditions. And so God, um, in Jeremiah, says that it was because of this Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah, and in the end, he thrust them from his presence. Very similar to Adam and Eve being thrust from the presence of God in the Garden of Eden. And we know that the temple was destroyed. Fast forward, of course, to Jesus in the New Testament. 
And now Jesus comes down and John 1, 1 reminds us that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus means God with us. Jesus is the presence of God on earth, back to walking, talking, living, breathing with men on earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And in fact, Jesus refers to that uh, in John 2, verse 19, where he says, if you destroy the temple, I will rebuild it in three days. Of course, he was talking about himself as the temple of God, himself representing that presence of God here on earth. And I love the term dwelt and dwelling. Uh, you can live somewhere, but where you dwell is where your heart is. And that's where Jesus uh, came down to earth and dwelt among us. And we know that, of course, when Jesus uh, was crucified, that the curtain in the temple, the curtain leading to the Holy of Holies, was ripped and torn. Those cherubim were torn apart, and now men had access to the Holy of Holies, to the presence of God, and to life everlasting. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But that's not where the story ends. Jesus is the temple of God. Jesus is the presence of God. And then last week, we hear those wonderful story about Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit came down to reside in each of us. And we now become the temple of God. We now become the presence of God on earth, which is a little bit scary in some ways, but that's what happens. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Uh, for we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. And 1 Peter 2 says, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So there's no need anymore for the sacrifice of that outer court. Jesus died as the ultimate sacrifice for us, for our sins, so that we would be able to enter the presence of God, cleansed and repented and saved. And so what I see when I read all of these passages and you follow the temple of God story or the temple of God analogy all the way through, is you realize that the Bible is not so much a history of God's, of man striving for God, but really it's the history of God striving for man. God trying to get back to that Garden of Eden relationship with his creation. God trying to allow men to have the presence of God and to understand what it is to have a living, breathing relationship with God. And here's my thing for today. I think sometimes what we like to do is we like to go to the outer court of the temple. Uh, the outer court, we know the Israelites knew what it was to have God in their lives. They knew um, that they had to come bring sacrifices to God and they knew they could pray for atonement and then they left. And I think sometimes, even though we know that the Holy of Holies has been open to us, maybe we are afraid to take the step into the Holy of Holies. We know that in the Holy of Holies, therein lies all the promises of God, those wonderful promises from Romans that all things work for good to those who are uh, called according to his purpose. Um, the, the verses that um, I will give you life and life abundant, the verse that says um, nothing can separate us from the love of God, but the in Jesus Christ. Those things live in the Holy of Holies. But so also do the verses that say that God will confess us if we confess him. I think there's some effort required in the Holy of Holies. If you think about the whole scriptures that we have, effort was what everybody, Abraham, Moses, Jonah, Job, Paul, the disciples, you name it, they put forth the effort. And that's what's required of us in the Holy of Holies. It might seem a little intimidating sometimes. Pastor Tony Evans tells this great story about a pastor who goes to visit one of his senior parishioners, and just, just as a visit. And he goes in, and this parishioner has set out a lovely tea for them. And on the coffee table, there's a beautiful crystal bowl. It's got peanuts in it. And the pastor visits for quite a while, and they have a lovely visit. And while the pastor's visiting, he's eating these peanuts. And 
it comes time for the pastor to leave. And he turns to the prisoner and says, oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. I've eaten all your peanuts. And the prisoner says, oh, not to worry. I'd already licked off all the chocolate. This is what we sometimes do, I think. I think we like the chocolate coating, the sweet, lovable, encouraging, joyful story of God's gift to us. We love that God wants to be in relationship with his people. But the peanuts require more work, more effort. And that relationship, a living, breathing relationship, the praying incessantly kind of relationship, the relationship where we confess God to other men, the relationship where we know that faith without works is dead, that relationship where we cross that little dividing floor into the Holy of Holies, knowing that it's open to us and that the gift of eternal life is for us, still sometimes seems a little intimidating. And it requires work. It requires eating the peanuts. It requires taking those steps that are necessary for us to really understand what it is to live and breathe in the presence of God. And so I'd encourage all of us today that we take that step, that we take the step across into the Holy of Holies. Don't stand in the outer court but take that step into the Holy of Holies and understand what it must have been like for Adam and God to walk and talk as best friends, best companions, uh, as a father and child relationship and every other relationship that shows us that God wants to be part of who we are and what we do. And that's our message for this morning. Don't be afraid to step into the Holy of Holies and to meet and experience that wonderful presence of God. Amen. Let us pray. God of communion and community, we give you thanks for our life together in Christ and the work of the Spirit that draws us closer to you and to each other. We pray for the life of our denomination as it meets in General Assembly. Send your Spirit to work in and through the commissioners and help us as your church in the world to work tirelessly to resolve differences and to celebrate that we are all your children. We pray for all who serve in the name of our church and for those who join in ministries supported by Presbyterian Sharing and Presbyterian World Service and Development. We lift up to you those conflicts internationally that continue to rage, and we remember the situation particularly in Israel. For the desperate conditions of refugees and displaced individuals in so many countries, we pray for your power and might to strengthen them and bring about your peace. Grant wisdom, O God, to the leaders in all countries, in business, politics, health care, and education, so the needs of the most vulnerable would steer their policies. God, we pray for those who are sick and suffering, those who are dealing with long-term illness, 
managing difficult medical diagnoses, recuperating at home or in hospital. Rest with them and bring them your peace. Strengthen the healthcare workers who are shouldering a great burden and encourage them with your grace. You are the God of love and hope and we thank you for all the people in our lives who encourage us, rejuvenate us, and remind us of the hope that exists in you. Help us to share that hope with those who are lonely, depressed, lost, and who are losing ground in light of uncertainties. We pray for your blessing on those whom we love. Hear our prayers as we offer them in the words of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.